The title of this gathering is, is called Oneness in the Heart of the World. So I thought I should talk a little bit about the heart, and in particular the mystical heart, which is one of the great secrets, really, of, of a human being. Um, just as we have a physical heart, we, we have a, that belongs to our physical body, we have a, a spiritual heart that belongs to our spiritual body. And this, this spiritual heart lies dormant within the human being until they make this step of turning towards God, which for the Sufis is called Tauba, the turning of the heart. And, and it is that initial moment that really awakens us to our divine nature for the first time in the Incarnation. And this is the moment when the, the mystical heart awakens. And without the awakening of the mystical heart, there is really no spiritual journey. Because just as you need a physical body to journey physically, so you need a, a spiritual body to journey spiritually. And for the Sufi, this journey takes place within the heart, within the, the mystical heart that is awakened and then becomes more and more dynamic as the journey continues. But this is not, of course, specific to Sufism. For example, in the Upanishads, when they talk about the self or the atma, it, it said, that person, no bigger than a thumb, maker of past and future, lives within the heart. So that our divine nature lives within the heart. And it is really the awakening of the heart is the awakening of our divine nature. And it is that consciousness within the heart, that consciousness of our divine nature, that has the direct experience of oneness that has, if you like, direct perception of life. And, and one of the, the miracles of life is that if we see it directly, without the interference of the ego and the mind and the thought patterns, it is one. It is the most natural experience of life that is experienced through the heart, through this consciousness within the heart. There's a a saying in the Upanishads when they talk about this. When they talk about this, this consciousness of oneness that belongs to the heart, that belongs to the self. And as I said, it is really one of the central esoteric secrets of what it means to be a human being. And what this heart really means. I often find it interesting that, that in our culture we, we talk a lot about love. But the love we talk about is usually between people. And it's often an emotion. We often call love an emotion. While really there is this pure, pure substance within the heart that is the essence of love. And the spiritual life, mystical life, is uncovering that essence, uncovering that, that substance. It's actually a very, very beautiful substance, this divine love within the heart. It is, it is almost like liquid gold. It is our divine nature and, and it is this divine love. And, and it exists within the heart. It is, it is really one of the greatest secrets of the human being. And one needs to understand this dimension of oneself, even to know that it exists. Because we live in a tremendously secular culture. And these esoteric secrets of the human being have been hidden. Maybe wisely they have been hidden. But there seems to be a, a need now at this time in humanity to reclaim 
that part of ourselves that there is a, a purpose to, to bring into the open this, this secret. Sufis are traditionally known as, as the people of the secret because they have kept for humanity this secret of what it really means to be a human being, which has to do with the heart, which has to do with love, which has to do with oneness. And, and remember, if you, if you perceive life through the heart, then you see it is one. You see that, that oneness all around you. How wonderful that a single essence should refract itself like light. A single source into a million essences and hues. This is the experience of life that you see how that, that single light and how it becomes the many. It is a direct experience of life through the heart. And again, Oneness is like the clear blue sky. Everything arises, unfolds, and subsides within its all-compassionate love. Oneness is our real self. Everything is an aspect of oneness, and our quest to know this comes from oneness. And remember, all this takes place within the consciousness of the heart. The quest to know oneness comes from the oneness within the heart. And that is why mystical life is a journey within the heart. And the heart is really so extraordinary. You know, it is just, the spiritual heart is just above the physical heart. And it is, it is the home of our divine nature. The, the, the Sufis say, in fact, there is a place within the spiritual heart that is the, the secret of secrets. is a special chamber within the heart that only God has access to. It is where the divine revelation actually takes place within the human being, in this chamber within the heart. And, and the Sufis say, in fact, that the real pilgrim on the path is, is not you or I. It is this secret substance within the path, within the heart within the heart of hearts. It is not you or I who are going to make the journey because as Father Keating said, that is what falls away. Any sense you have of yourself, it falls away. The journey is a falling away of all those images you have of yourself. And then what is revealed underneath is something so infinitely precious, so infinitely simple, so inf incredibly beautiful. And for the Sufis, incredibly tender. There is this because it is a love affair, it is a love affair of infinite tenderness that takes place within us. And, you know, you always remember, like you remember the first kiss you ever had. It, it is stamped into you. And, and the first experience you have of that love, of that tenderness within the heart is like, remains with you. I remember how it was for myself. I think I was about 29, 20, maybe 27. And I was lying in meditation one day and suddenly I felt these butterfly wings on the edge of my heart. They were just like the gentlest, gentlest touching on the edge of the heart. And those butterfly wings filled the whole of my being with this sweet, sweet love. There was nobody there. I always say it's the the intoxication and, and, of course, the incredible vulnerability is it happens on the very inside of the heart. Everybody else has to come to get close to you from the outside. And there's this whole drama of human relationships where you have to get to know the person and you have your barriers and your defenses and your images of yourself that stand in the way. And then there is this mystical relationship with, you can call it God, you can call it the self, it doesn't matter. And it happens on the inside of the heart. That is why it is so incredibly vulnerable, that is why it can be so incredibly painful, that is why it is so tender. And as I say, that first experience I had, I was brought up in a family where we didn't know much about love. You know, we were a good English middle class family with good job and good income and good schools but love wasn't really on the agenda. I didn't even know what love was. And 
And then there was this, say, butterfly wings on the edge of my heart. And I have had deeper experiences of love since then, more intoxicating, more enveloping, more powerful. But that first touch of a divine lover coming into your heart, coming to you, why? One doesn't know. It is not because one is good. It is not because one is spiritual. It is, in a way, like Father Keating said, it is because one is, one is miserable. <laughs> because, in fact, I, I was very touched by what he said because it reminded me of a, of a Sufi story told by Attar, who was a great Sufi. And, and somebody, in the story, somebody asked Bayezid Bistami, who was one of the early Sufis, he says, what do we have to give God? And Bayezid said, God has everything. God is all-powerful. God is omnipotent. He can see the future. He can see the pa past. What he doesn't have, his need, is helplessness. That is what we have to give God. Uh, because he doesn't have that. And it is this very human quality. And, and when I experienced that, that love, it, it was that tenderness that came to me because I had a need to be loved. And it was in the heart, but it was also in my whole being. It goes right into the cells of the body. There is one of the mystical secrets is, is that this love affair, it, it is not an idealized romance. It doesn't happen somewhere else. It happens in the heart, but it also happens in the body. But one can be loved on a cellular level by one's beloved. It is, I think, one of the most intimate, intoxicating experiences you can have. It's not always sweet, actually. I was thinking about it the, um, this morning, and I remembered the Bernini's um, sculpture of St. Teresa of Avila. I'm sure many of you know it. It's an incredibly beautiful sculpture of, of her being pierced by this arrow of love. If, if you, you can look at it on the internet, and it's a marble sculpture. It's this St. Teresa of Avila in complete intoxication. And the, the sculpture was, was made from this description. She describes herself. Um, Beside me on the left appeared an angel in bodily form. He was not tall but short and very beautiful. And his face was so aflame that he appeared to be one of the highest ranks of angels, who seemed to be all on fire. In his hands I saw a great golden spear, and at the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire. This he plunged into my heart several times, so that it penetrated to my entrails. When he pulled it out, I felt that he took them with it, and left me utterly consumed by the great love of God. The pain was so severe that it made me utter several moans. The sweetness caused by this intense pain is so extreme that one cannot possibly wish it to cease, nor is one's soul content with anything but God. This is not a physical but a spiritual pain, though the body has some share in it, even a considerable share. And one of the extraordinary things is that the mystical heart, it is attached to the physical heart. That is why sometimes when you feel that pain of longing for God in your heart, in the spiritual heart, you also can be a physical pain in the heart. And I have had people in our group who've gone to have MRIs, to have checkups, <laughs> because the heart, the physical heart started to behave strangely. Because this is mysticism, this is love, you do not know what is going to happen. But The human heart, the human spiritual heart, is, is an organ of incredible beauty, of incredible tenderness. It is the meeting place of you and God. It is really this sacred place within your own being. And as I say, the journey begins when it is awakened. Without that awakening, without that moment of tauba, then nothing can happen because that chamber is not opened, and it is always an act of grace. It is not because you are a good person. It is because he loves you. This is the, 
the whole mystery of he loves them and they love him, which is, to me is the, the foundation of mysticism, the foundation of spiritual consciousness. But he loves us. He loves everything. Everything is loved by God. This, this chair is infinitely loved by God. Everything is an expression of love. But not everything is conscious of it. And those who are drawn to love, drawn to the mysticism of love, they, they have a longing to make this conscious. To make conscious this meeting of the human being and God within the heart. This mystery of love that is, say, that one of the great secrets of being a human being, that you can be a place where the divine makes itself known through the mystery of love. Of course, it, it can be very painful. One of the, the definitions of, of Sufism was Sufism was at first heartache, only later it became something to talk about. It is this, this cry within the heart, this, this, this sweet pain that is this infinite longing that you have for God. But this pain, this longing, this makes you alive in a way few other things makes you alive. Because it, it makes alive the real human being, not the mind, but this divine consciousness. Because the heart is the home of the divine consciousness. Father Keating was talking about these levels of consciousness, even from the vegetable and the animal and the rational consciousness. And then there is the mystical consciousness. And I am convinced that at this stage in our evolution, in our collective evolution, the mystical consciousness has a central role to play. And one of the reasons is because it knows the secrets of oneness. It actually, in the heart, <laughs> it knows the secrets of life. It knows the secrets of, of the atoms of everything in creation. There is... There is a saying again, I think, by Attar. I'm not very good with my pieces of paper at the moment, but I hope to find it. He says, When love comes, reason disappears. Reason disappears. Reason cannot live with the folly of love. But then, but then he talks about how the, the secrets of the atoms are known within this consciousness of the heart. This is the valley of love. In this love, in this valley, love is represented by fire and reason by smoke. When love comes, reason disappears. Reason cannot live with the folly of love. Love has nothing to do with human reason. If you possessed inner sight, the atoms of the visible world would be manifested to you. But if you look at things with the eye of ordinary reason, you will never understand how necessary it is to love. Only a man who has been tested and is free can feel this. He who understands this journey should have a thousand hearts so that he can sacrifice one at every moment. And, and what Atar is hinting at is in the knowing of the heart, in this mystical knowing that contains oneness, the secrets of creation are also present. Um, the Sufis call it the secret of the word kun, to be. That there is in the atoms of creation, in the manifest world, there is an extraordinary secret. It was, I think, known by the alchemists when they talk about the light hidden in matter. It is, just as there is a great mystical secret within the heart of human beings, so there is also a mystical secret within creation, within the heart of the world. And in my understanding, at this time, there needs to be a meeting of the two, the meeting of the mystical heart of the human being and the, and the mystical heart of the world, the spiritual center of the world. Because that is where magic happens. That is where the divine can rearrange creation. We, we, have been, we have been so used to 
creation following certain laws, whether you call it Newtonian physics. And we have forgotten the, the, the divine, that actually creation is an expression of the divine, that actually creation is a, is a joyous, playful expression of the divine. We have forgotten that even the miracles can happen, as I was saying. And there is this, this place where the, the human heart meets creation that allows a spark to go from the divine consciousness within the human heart to the divine within creation. I think this is really what is meant by, by co-creation in its deepest sense, that the divine within us can participate directly with the divine within creation. Now I know how this happens within a human being, how they can be given a spark of divine love. So we call it Tauba in Sufism, that awakens the human being to their divine nature, that begins them on this most extraordinary journey, which is a complete transformation of the human being, which is finally this merging in God, this unio mystica, I am he whom I love, he whom I love is me. That this is this love, and the love within the heart draws us into this mystery, into this mystery of divine oneness, which is really our birthright. And it is sad that it has been sold for so little, that we sell this incredibly precious birthright we have, that, that we are <laughs> welcomed into the kingdom of God that is here, that is present that is within our own hearts and also where our heart meets life. To me, this is what really mystical life is, is that our heart meets life. My teacher, he said, to, to, mystical life is to bear the heat and burden of the day, but not to bear it as a burden, to bear it as a, a place where love comes into being where the secret within your heart speaks to you and speaks to creation. And then, as I say, then something comes alive. I know it within the, within the individual because when the heart becomes alive, the whole life changes. It, it is like going from black and white to color. In fact, I had that experience in my own life because looking back, I was, I was born into a materialistic middle-class family and there was no spiritual life. I didn't even know that spiritual life existed when I grew up. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Nobody talked about it. We spoke about politics. We spoke about the family. But the idea there is such a thing as spiritual consciousness didn't exist. And I'm sure for many of you it was the same. And then one day in a tube train in London, a Zen koan turned a switch on inside of me. And my life went from grays, black and white and grays, to color in an afternoon. Suddenly, I saw the colors in creation. I saw the joy in creation. I saw the light dancing behind the flowers. I saw a creation that was vibrantly alive. I didn't know anything about God then. It was a Zen experience. But now I could see, I would say I saw the divine present within creation for the first time. Because something in me woke up, the heart woke up, the spiritual consciousness woke up. And that is the, in a way, the turning point for the human being. Not everybody has it so dramatically, but the heart is turned. The Sufis say the heart is turned. In fact, the whole of the Sufi journey is the turning of the heart. And one, if you like, one can say that the the whirling dervishes and the beautiful dance they do is just an outer expression of this inner mystical mystery of the turning of the heart. There is a, a very moving story that belongs to our particular tradition that one of the grandfather guru, he is called, one of the old Sufis in, in northern India, and they were a family of Sufis. And it's said that they heard that a great saint had come to a nearby town, so they went to visit him. And these three, three Sufis, they went and they sat in the courtyard of this saint. And because it was India and it was a while ago and time wasn't so precious, they sat there for three days. And then the saint asked, why have you come? I love that. Imagine just being able to go and sit somewhere for three days before somebody says, why have you come? <laughs> you know? It, it, it is like, 
a different courtyard at different times. So the saint asked them, why have you come? And, and they said, we heard you were a great saint of the time. And the man said, yes, go and get me the biggest rock you can. And they went and they found the great big boulder and they rolled it into the courtyard of the saint. And with one look, he split this rock in two. And he turned to them and he said, what do you think? And they said, we thought you were a great saint. We just see you are a charlatan, a magician. And then they said these lines that have always stayed with me. They said, we are simple people, but we know how to turn the heart of a human being where it can take that person where you cannot even imagine. And that is really the central mystery of Sufism, the turning of the heart. It is, it is actually very beautifully done. You blow on the heart of a human being. You blow on the heart of a human being with a breath that has the name of God and the name of the human, the esoteric name of the human being written in it. I don't know if you know that every human being has a spiritual name. It's what is written in the book of life. That is their name. And it, it is their, their true self, the name of their true self. And, and then, say that the heart starts to turn and this mystery of what it really means to be a human being gets woken up inside of you. It, as I say, for me, the, one of the great mysteries is not that we are God, it's that we've forgotten that we are God. That I, I mentioned last night this experience I had when I saw the true nature of these children. And that we live covered and covered and covered so that we don't know this. We don't know what our heart is like. We don't know how incredibly beautiful it is. I, I quote now from Shams, who was the, the, the teacher of Rumi. As most of you know, Rumi was a, a theological professor until one day in the marketplace, he met this wandering dervish called Shams. And his whole life changed. Suddenly he was drawn into the mystery of love, into this divine intoxicating mystery until when he was asked to describe his life, he said, I burnt and I burnt and I burnt. And he, he had a very tragic relationship with Shams, if you think about it, because his disciples and his, his sons got, got jealous of Shams, so Shams left. And Rumi was so devastated that he sent his son, his eldest son, Sultan Valad, to, to Damascus to find Shams. And they brought Shams back, and then there was this reunion of, of, of lovers of God. You know, to be, with, to be with somebody else who really loves God, I think, is one of the greatest gifts one can be given. There is a, a poem, I think, by Rumi, be with those who mix with God as honey blends with milk, with those who say anything that comes and goes, that rises and sets, is not what I love. To be in the company of those who love God is, is, is a great privilege to, to share that, to share that knowing of the heart. Anyway, the, his son, Sultan Valad, brought Shams back to Rumi. And then again, there was this strange tragedy that nobody quite knows what happens, that one evening Shams left. He went out, and he was never found again. And it's thought possibly that Rumi's own son killed him out of jealousy, because his father loved him so much, because they had this mystical meeting. And, and that broke Rumi's heart completely. It, it is actually one of the... Of the signposts on the journey, it's not a signpost, one of the stages on the journey is your heart has to be broken by love. Because most people's heart is, is very confined and small, it's all about them. And the real nature of the mystical heart is it's a home for God. There's this saying, I am with those whose hearts are broken for my sake. It's very beautiful, I am with those whose hearts are broken for my sake. And there is a stage on the mystical journey when your heart has to be broken. Because that is the only way it can reveal its vastness. The heart, the real heart is so big, heaven and earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my devoted servant can. The real mystical heart of a human being is bigger than the world. It is, you can put anything into it. But to go back to, to Shams, who was a real mystic, who understood this, he said, the heart is greater more spacious, 
more subtle and brighter than the heavens and the circling spheres. So why do you constrict it with thoughts and whispering doubts? Why should you make the pleasant world your narrow prison? How can you make this garden-like world into a prison? Like a caterpillar, you weave a web of thoughts and whispering doubts and blameworthy images around your own makeup. Then you become a prisoner and suffocate. Me, I've made the prison a garden for myself. If my prison is a garden, just think what my garden must be. And that is what the Sufis call really taking care of one's heart. We call it polishing the mirror of the heart. So, because the heart is so precious, it is this meeting place of God and the human being. It is the place where this love affair happens. And they say this love affair is not, it's not just something written about in books. It is the most intoxicating, demanding, sweet, terrible thing that can ever happen to you. And it's real. And sometimes you just want to go to bed at night just so you can turn away from the world and open your heart to your beloved. Say, beloved, I am here for you now. I have done the business of the world. Now we have time together to have this sweet discourse of love. And it is this, again, this secret. It is, I think, at the very core of creation because it is this mystery of he loves them and they love him. And it is said the whole world was created out of love. The whole world is love. The, whole, the fabric of life is love. And for some reason, I don't quite know why, most people are too busy. They have other things to do. They may read about love in romantic novels, see it in Hollywood films. They, they look for the traces of love. But love is all around us because love is... Everything is love. And this is what you come to know when the heart is awakened. You, you, you come to know this real love. There is actually in the, I'm sure many of you know the, the Song of Solomon, which is, which is the, the Christian mystical treat, treatise on mystical love. And it, if you don't know it, you really should read it. There are some beautiful, beautiful lines when he says, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Slay me, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. I mean, the banqueting house and the banner over me was love. When it's just this incredible embrace in love. And then this very important line, I sleep but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, open to me my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. And if you remember, there was a question I answered yesterday about the heart awake, being awakened. That whatever you do, your heart is awakened. And that is really what happens when the heart begins to spin. Whatever you do in life, there is, your heart is awakened and there is inner discourse of love that takes place mostly behind the scenes. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. And you begin to live always in this love affair, this inner love affair. And sometimes this inner love affair is reflected out into life. And you, you fall in love with all sorts of things in life. Because life actually is a love affair. Again, we have forgotten. I often think we have forgotten so much and then we have even forgotten that we have forgotten. So many of the, the, the mystical secrets of life has been covered over and covered over and covered over as if we have been denied our heritage. I don't know why it happened. There was a time when everybody grew up knowing that the world was sacred, knowing that life was a relationship with what was sacred. That when you baked bread, it was a sacred activity, and when you ate the bread, it was a sacred activity. And now we have to reclaim it. And we have to reclaim it for our own hearts and the heart of the world because without this spark of mystical love, without this knowledge of mystical love, nothing can be born. You can create whatever you like, whatever ideas, but without that spark, 
without that core of he loves them and they love him. It is all just another illusion. It is not real. And, and one thing we have also lost is we think love is a feeling. When we are in love, we are full of this feeling. Yes, love has feelings, but it is also consciousness. It, it is strange for many people to think that love is consciousness. But love is actually a higher consciousness than our rational consciousness. And it is a consciousness of oneness, which is why the mystics say, when you see with the eye of the heart, you see that everything is one. For example, I, I give you an example just now. I can look at you two ways. I can look at you with the consciousness up here in my mind, and I see there are all these different people having different clothes, sitting in different chair seats. Or I can just go into the, my heart, into the consciousness of the heart, and I see that you are all one. That you are all just one living being. It is very beautiful. And how you all relate together, and how some people's hearts are more open than other people's hearts. And that is the, the mystical knowing of the heart. That, that sees the oneness in life. That sees, not, not as an idea, but as a living reality. Because we are one, and love is about oneness. That, that is why in a human relationship, if you really love somebody, you want to get closer and closer and closer until you even want to merge physically with them. A friend of mine, an old, very wise woman, she said, she couldn't understand it. She said, everybody spends all of their teenage years trying to separate themselves from their parents. And then the first opportunity, they want to merge with somebody again and give it all up. But love is that. It pulls us to oneness because... The nature of love is oneness. If you really love, if you really love with your heart and your heart is open, you see the oneness in things. You are the oneness in things. And it is a consciousness. It is a knowing. It is actually a knowing of the real nature of life. And, and that is again something in our culture for some strange reason we have forgotten. And <laughs> I always remember this experience I had at Seattle Airport about 10 years ago. I was waiting, and you know you wait in these waiting rooms between, uh, between flights, and, and people are talking on the cell phone and reading and, and talking with each other or just sitting there. I guess nowadays they'd have you know, earphones, be listening to iPods. That was before then. And I saw suddenly you get given these moments when the veils lift. The Sufis call it the veils. The veils lift, and you see things as they really are. And for a moment, the veils lifted, and I saw how each human being was full of the light of God. It was like up to here. It was like somebody had, had poured in the light of God, this beautiful golden light. And I saw that the real mystery was not that they were full of the light of God, but they didn't know it. That was what was the extraordinary mystery, that we don't know how precious we are. We don't know how valuable we are. And... It is somehow the, the, the great tragedy of this culture that it, it leads us down so many false paths, down so many dead-end streets. And it kind of overlooks what is most essential, which is our divine nature. And in many, many previous cultures, that was the basis of life. That was the center around which all the activities went. And it was always there. And if there wasn't a shaman in the tribe to hold it, then the, the tribe would have lost something. In fact, years ago I went to the Hopi reservation and talked to the person who did the, the serpent dance. And he said one of the tragedies was there was nobody to pass the serpent dance on to at that time. That that particular... Because the Hopis live a very, very sacred life, a very symbolic life. They hold that tradition. And yet, there was nobody to pass the dance on to. But at this time, at any time when something becomes lost, then something cries out. And some of you have heard it, this cry of the heart of the world or the soul of the world is cried out because it is dying. Because it needs to be, it, it cannot survive on Coca-Cola. It just can't. It, it needs something real. 
And traditionally, what is real is within the sparks, the, is the spark within the heart of those who belong to God. That is the, the contribution the mystic makes to humanity. That is the, in a way, our heart is the heart of the world. Those who, who are destined or drawn or called to live this life of divine love, to live this life of the heart, to live this life of this innermost secret of, huma of humanity. And traditionally, they, they just hold it for humanity. The people of the secret, they hold that secret for humanity. And those who are drawn to find that secret, find their way to a company of friends, usually in a remote area, in a mountain, in a desert, or even hidden in the most ordinary places. They find their way to that secret. It's never publicized. It's never talked about in public. But they, they find their way there, those who are drawn to live this mystery of the heart, the real, what it really means to be human being. But there is a need now because life is hungry for that truth. There is so little that is true in life. So many, so much has been corrupted. We have been sold and resold you know, second-hand goods, second-hand spirituality. For so long, we don't even know what's real anymore. But we all have within our heart this spark of what is real. You can't package it. You can't sell it. Nobody... It, it, it belongs to God. It is really grace. But it is needed in life because, because it belongs to life, just as life belongs to God. It can take you, yes, that spark can take you through many, many inner worlds. I've had the privilege to be able to go in meditation deep, deep into many inner worlds, beautiful inner worlds, vast. There are oceans of love there. If you knew the vastness of the love there, you, you, you would die. That is why I quoted Rumi when, when he said, this is not the Oxus River or some little creek. This is the shoreless sea. Here swimming ends always in drowning. There is so much love. It is, you just gasp. And, and there is more, and there is more, and it's deeper and deeper, and the oneness gets deeper and deeper. It is interesting. We think of the idea of oneness as being a static state. You see that everything is one. Actually, oneness is a highly dynamic state. It gets deeper and deeper, more and more encompassing, more and more inclusive. It is like, it is like love. One... One Sufi, Dul Nun, he had a, a vision in which he was walking with a woman on the shore of the sea and he said, what is the end of love? And she said, idiot, love has no end, just like the sea has no end. Love is endless. You can go and go and go further and further into the mysteries of love and even beyond love. There are places even beyond love, vast, vast emptinesses, planes of non-being. But something calls back into this world, into this world of forms that needs this, this divine spark, this divine essence, something that is real, something that cannot be corrupted. If you, if you know real love, it can never be corrupted. It cannot be bought and sold. It is like, I always say it is the difference between what most people think of love and real love is like, the difference between alcohol-free beer and 100% proof alcohol. I mean, it's why the Sufis say traditionally, keep away, keep away from the lane of love. Because it is so dangerous, because it intoxicates you, because once you've had one sip of that, you don't want anything else. You would sell everything, give everything away for just another sip of love. It is the most, the greatest power in creation, and the most dangerous thing. Because it destroys you. Say, when love comes, reason disappears. Reason cannot live with the folly of love. It cuts open your heart. It makes you more vulnerable than you ever want to be. And you can't do anything. You are a fool for love. You are a madman. Love is a madman working his wild schemes. But the heart is this extraordinary place where this mystery happens. And we each have it. It is... 
As I say, it is our birthright. It is a simple mystical secret, but just there in the center of our chest, there is this place where we can be with God, where God can be with us. There is this, where this secret can, can become known. And if we live it, you don't live it for yourself because that love kills you. There's this expression in Sufism, you go gladly to the gallows like Al-Halaj. And Al-Halaj was the great martyr of love. He, he, he was killed for proclaiming an al haq I am the truth. And he lived the mystery of love, the oneness of love. Until then, it had been a secret. Nobody, apart from the initiates of Sufis, ever spoke about in public. In fact, there was a great Sufi, Junaid, who said he was punished because he made that secret public. This oneness, that in love we are one, we are one with God. This is simple and profound, beautiful and terrible, like any love affair. And Al-Halaj was crucified because of that. He was actually hung, drawn, and quartered. And that is why the Sufis say he paid the ultimate price. He paid the blood that is demanded of all lovers. Now, most of us are not going to do anything quite so dramatic. But this love, as Thomas Keating said, it gets rid of the false self. It gets rid of who you think you are. It gets rid of the ego. And this is a painful process. I think it's infinitely worthwhile because it is so glorious what we really are. This love, it is so tender. It loves us in ways we cannot even imagine or dare to think we can be loved. It comes, Rumi says, it comes like a thief in the night. When you don't expect it, suddenly there is a sweetness in the heart. Where did it come from? Why is your beloved suddenly just there with you, reminding you of his love? Why? Why, do, why are you loved? And, and most people search for love, and love is, is present. This is the, the oneness of love. This is the... This is what, what we really are. And as I say, the, there is a need for this mystery to be made known, to be lived, not hidden in retreat, but to say, that belongs to life. I am he, who, he loves her, he loves them and they love him, belongs to life. And it is within our own heart. It is the divine consciousness within our own heart. And as I said yesterday, in a way, all you have to do is say, yes, beloved, use me. I offer to thee the only thing I have, my capacity of being used by thee. It's very simple. And then we become part of the mystery of a human being and the mystery of life. And we are there at the very center of life. I said yesterday, I quoted Meister Eckhart, God is a circle whose center is everywhere. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. Like Father Keating said, it is a state of being. It is also a state of living more intensely than most people ever dream. You live on the very edge. What security is there here for our caravanserai when every moment the camel bells cry, pack up their loads? The dark night, the fear of the whirlpool, how can they know of our state, those who go safely along the shore? Most people never dare to venture into the sea of love. They hear tales of it. They like to read a little bit of Rumi. It's like Coleman Barks, he said at one time, Hallmark approached him and to, to use some of his translations of Rumi and he said to them, this is not the love you want. This is a love that will destroy you. So they didn't have Coleman Barks' translations on the Hallmark cards. <laughs> But it does mean to be really alive. It does mean to be really 
present in life as it really is, because life is a love affair. Life is a mystery waiting to happen, just as we are a mystery waiting to happen. And it is also something very intimate, like every love affair. It is this intimate experience within your own heart. Sometimes you don't want to talk to anybody about it. You can't. It is sweet and tender and terrible. I sleep but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that calls to me. And to me that is what it means to be mystic, to live this love affair of, with God. And what happens is really between your soul and God. It doesn't have much to do with you. This is one of the kind of sidetracks of spiritual life. It isn't really about you. You are the, the waste product, if you like, <laughs> of this relationship with God. That's, that's why in Sufism one becomes less than the dust at the feet of the teacher. One becomes just a little bit of dust blown by the wind. You don't matter, but you are allowed to give yourself or to give your heart. I think you give your heart. I think the real surrender, the real sacrifice is you give your heart to God for him to enact his love affair within your heart. And sometimes you are allowed to experience it. Sometimes the veils lift and, and you see this wonder that is this beauty, this incredible love. I always say, if people knew how much they were loved, the, their problems would go away. You know, we, we actually cover ourselves, we protect ourselves with our problems, with our images of ourselves. And all around us, there is this great mystery. It is like they discover now there is, you know, there is more dark energy and more dark matter than there is matter. It is all around us, waiting to happen. And, and I think we just need to, to say yes to, to st the Sufis call it stepping into the arena of love. And you know in the gladiatorial arenas, the, the gladiator, they turn towards the imperial box and they said, Moritori te salutant, imperator. Those about to die salute thee. And that is all you have to do. What happens then is, is his business. It's the business of the beloved and the business of love. This incredible mystery that is waiting to be lived. If you dare, if you dare to step out of the, the safe confines of what you think you are into the mystery, into the wonder, into the vastness of what you really are. That's why he says, heaven and earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my devoted servant can. The heart, this heart, this spiritual organ can get as big as the universe. It is amazing. It is, there is nothing more beautiful. It starts to spin. It starts to, well, I won't say what it does, but it takes you where you cannot even imagine. Into the beyond and also more and more into the real mystery of what this planet really is of what is really happening here, of what is struggling to come alive, of this beauty that is waiting to happen, of the heart of the world that is waiting to wake up. And all we have to do is to say yes.